And we are live on Oz Property Investors. We bring the big names and we have the big cash flow fund tonight. We've got the oh. Sean Craig from the ho the hosting co. Is that your is that your logo? Is that what, what, it is the logo. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah, you know, I thought it was maybe like a, one of those castaway, you know, the those those waters that they do. Yeah, that's pretty tropical. Cool. Tropical. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I talk some random rubbish. Don't I? How are you going anyway, Sean? What's happening? Very well. Thank you for having me on today. It's been a, a busy week, but been looking forward to the, this chat for the week. So, ready to jump on into it. If you're looking forward to talking to us, yeah, thanks for thanks for saying that. But <laughs> I think I hope there's many more exciting things than talking about. I'll take it as a compliment. How are you going, away, Joe? What's happening? Buying properties and negotiating deals and wearing lump sort of cameras. Yeah, absolutely. It, this is uh, this is a super exciting treat. Um, I'm speaking to a lot of investors and what I'm starting to see a shift in the market is it used to be, you know, let's say a year ago, two years ago, it used to be cash, uh, capital growth, capital growth, find me that capital growth, give it to me, give it to me. Now, as interest rates start to rise, inflation starts to uh, jump up a little bit. People are like, actually, what about cash flow? Let's talk about that. How do we create more value? How do we grow our cash flow little thing? Because I know that the, this property is going to grow in value over the next 20 years, but is it going to grow in cash flow over the next one? How do I hold it over the long term? And that's what I'm excited about chatting with Sean about. I think that's How a, do we, yeah. It's a big thing at the moment, like the way interest rates have rapidly gone up, depending on where you are, like it's a considerable amount extra people are needing to find each week. So you can see why people are now considering alternatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. I think, um, I think there's yeah we'll, we'll talk to why Airbnb sort of for other thing but yeah I'm I'm, I'm going pretty good I'm uh, sort of excited about the <laughs> anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd ask myself sorry to, sometimes now go it's too hot I, I need a fan or I need something but I'm excited for this session because I I asked a question about what people want to hear about and Airbnb came up quite a lot so and and I I think it's been a topic for a couple of years so I don't interest rates have impacted that but also people it's just one of those sexy parts of property that People talk about a barbecue. It's like, oh, you know, I just got the Airbnb down the coast and it's printing money for it. It's making me hundreds of dollars a week. And it's just one of those topics people are like, yeah, I love it. Let's let's get into it. So um, shall we do the quote of the week? And then I'll introduce what we're going to talk about. How does that sound, Joe? Let's do it. Let's mix it up. Sean, what is your quote of the week, mate? My quote of the week comes from Tim Ferriss. And I'm going to, so I'm not paraphrasing. Essentially, if we define risk as the likelihood of an irreversible negative outcome, Inaction is the greatest risk of all. No. So essentially, essentially, the crux of that is doing nothing is a risk in in and of itself. It is it's so it's so true. Yeah, like people don't see the opportunity cost. Um, there was someone in the group today that was like, "Oh, I'm going to buy this uh, this this off the plan apartment," um, but that's you know at, at least they're taking action, um, but people don't see the opportunity cost. They're like, oh, you know, I only lost $15,000 because it didn't grow very much. Well, actually, what is the opportunity cost of, of that? Like you could have actually made $50,000. Um, you didn't answer and- their question though, Joe. You just did that whole big post and they, they wanted to know what color to paint the thing though. It needed to be white. I didn't, white. I didn't answer the question. <laughs> That's okay. Light and bright. If you want to, if you want to make things pretty light and bright. Um, but I love that. I love that quote. That actually feeds quite nicely into my quote, which is uh, from Walt Disney. The way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Um, a lot of people talk about how great they are and what they're going to do. And, you know, I'm sure we all have those friends. And I guess that's why we have this group is, is like-minded property people taking action. Um, Sean, you've taken massive action when it comes to Airbnb. And, and Jeff, you've taken mass- massive action too as well. Um, I'm so laughing I'm on the inside off and me and my wife have this joke about people that plan to make a plan and it's just exactly that, like just that planning, 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 but never actually doing. <laughs> Don't be yeah. wrong. I, I, I plan as well. So I plan, I plan a lot. So if I, yeah, so also for people watching, let us drop us a like, throw us a comment because I see there's at least one comment. It's probably um, Brayden, Brayden. Brandon Crawl, Craw, he normally drops a comment. I, I like how he does that just to get us going. My quote of the week is creativity is inventing, experiments and growing, taking risks, breaking rules, making mistakes and having fun. So that was uh, Mary Lee Cook, an American actress. So I think that I, I try and sort of mix up where I get my quotes from. I don't like to necessarily get them from 
like a dead philosopher or a stoic or something because it can get a little sort of yeah we like to sort of mix it up and i like um i like that one because it sort of epitomizes what you can get from an airbnb type um type property so let's let's go it's getting, getting what are you talking here. about today jeff Oh, we lost you. Yeah, so shall we? Um, I was going to say before we get into introducing Sean from the Host and Go, shall we introduce our first sponsor and then get into it, Joe? The amazing thing with commercial property investing is that in most cases, it's cash flow positive from day one, which means that you can drive those profits towards paying down the debt. There are instances with commercial property investing where you can actually have the property pay itself off over 10 years, which is absolutely crazy. With commercial property, you get massive net yield. So you can expect anywhere between six to 10%. And as we've seen in the current boom, these properties not only provide large cash flow, they do certainly grow wildly in value too. Now with big rewards comes some risk. And this is why you should de-risk your investment as much as possible. And the way you do that is with expert due diligence. And this is why we highly recommend people hire professionals to help you along in your investing journey. Steve Polisi of Polisi Property is one such expert. Being a chartered mechanical and structural engineer in a past life, Steve draws on his analytical and mathematical skills to do that expert due diligence for you. With six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He's the guy you want in your corner, crunching the numbers and finding the best properties in the best locations, along with ensuring that you avoid the mistakes. Steve has actually even written the book on commercial property investing in Australia. And not only is it a bestseller, I believe it to be the most comprehensive in commercial property investing on the market today. He's been generous enough to give us a massive discount for our audience of 50%. So use the code OZPROP, click the link below, get a copy today and start learning and getting on your commercial property investing journey. There we go. Absolutely. You've got some. So the, now, now on to Airbnb and I see that the comments are rolling. The crowd is going wild. So what we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to talk about how, what identifying the properties that work with Airbnb what what's uh, what sort of what sort of works with those? We're going to talk about the management, including the returns. So stick around for that one. We're going to be sort of talking about the middle. So you have to keep watching. To, you never know when we'll talk about it. Uh, everybody wants to know how much money am I, going to, am I going to make? And last but not least, how can you optimize? Now Sean's actually going to show us some ways that you can spend not a lot of money, but actually make things look super sexy in your Airbnb if you're planning on doing one of those. So I think I've summed that up quite nicely. So Sean and I've got a I've got a quick and quick and snazzy intro for you. So you are a property investing Airbnb real estate with ten years experience, and you're known as investing in Cairns YouTube. So you do all your you're, you're a self proclaimed numbers man, but you also look at your customized strategies to increase your occupancy rates with your Airbnb. But interestingly, or importantly as well, you are a proud dad who always seems to find something to smile about. And you're smiling now, so don't miss anything. <laughs> No, that sounds about it. That's a nice little wrap. I'll take that. Yep. No, no. I think you're growing. I think somebody said you're the you're the best Airbnb in final best Airbnb kind of company in final Queensland. So sure, well, you said it. I'll take it. Yep. Yeah, I'm trying to think who that was, but yeah, that was that was a good one. So, <laughs> so out there. Yeah. So you want to you, you ask the first question? I feel like I've been talking too much, man. Well, I'm yeah. And we always like to ask the, the the guests about their their first um, investment property. So yeah, how did you get into the the property world, and what did your first purchase look like? Yeah, yep, yep. So I think I've always been just a little bit entrepreneurial. Sort of, I've always liked the idea of using something to make money. Um, I remember as being a young kid having like a little candy shop at home that I used to sell candy to my siblings and mum and dad and that. So it was always sort of that little bit of a spark but I actually bought my first property when I was 20 um, and while that sounds like super impressive back when I bought that they used to have like the first home buyers grant and I think it was 7,000 in Queensland yeah and the first property I bought was 135,000 so I think I needed an $8,000 deposit and for people who are thinking that's like crazy you must have been born in the 60s that doesn't exist you can still buy a property in Cairns under 200,000 so, like, it's still super affordable up here. 
the funny backstory or not funny story or take it as you will, I bought that property in, it was 2010 for 135000 and sold it in 2019, nine years later for 155. So it went up like next to nothing in like nine years. Um, but lessons learnt and <laughs> things move forward. <laughs> what was the key lesson from, from that? Like why didn't it grow? Because Kansas, like, I mean, you're previously a real estate agent, so you would know all about the Cairns market. Like, you would be, um, yes. but why did this one not grow? So that unit, so I sold it in 2019 for, I think, 155 It's probably worth about 210 now. Ooh. So, like, I just perfectly missed the cycle. <laughs> um, bought it for 135 It was probably worth, like, 110 for a while there. Mm. And then it went up a little bit and I sold it and broke even and then, COVID come and it had its crazy run that we're, we're still seeing today. But so the, think, um, yeah. the opportunity, opportunity cost though that Joe spoke about uh, with off mm. the plane, I think, yes, it might have. And similar with, with my property in, in sort of North Brisbane, I sold and I see it now. They're selling for 20, 30, 40, 50,000 more. I'm like, yeah, I might have missed a little bit, but what is that property going to do over the next five or 10 years? But um, yep. is that when you sell? Would that be airbnb -able? That's all Absolutely, it would, would have been. And that was just pre us entering into to this market. But yeah. essentially, with that unit that I bought for 135, the tenant was paying off the loan for me and it was cash flow positive from the get go. Mm -hmm. When I sold it, I think I had a loan of about 85 on it. Mm -hmm. So I think I walked away with just over 70 grand cash from it. And that actually oh. set us up to buy a, a property that well, it made a quite a good amount of money on. So as much as it didn't grow, just the cash flow and the tenant paying it off definitely opened up other doors. Yeah. Okay. And um, how did you get into, how did you venture? What was your first, um, that was a great question, wasn't it? What was your first Airbnb? How did you get into the world of Airbnb and how did you fall down that path? Yeah. Part? So it's funny how the world sometimes works. I, an old housemate of mine started working for the, the local hospital up here, which is, quite a big hospital that services a really large catchment and they were having trouble. So they get a lot of contract um, workers coming in and working at the hospital. They were having trouble finding accommodation and essentially the budget for their accommodation for their staff that come up and the nurses is $150 a night. And right. $150 a night doesn't sound like a lot because it's not a lot. To find a hotel, to find something reasonable for $150 a night, you're really struggling where you convert that into $1,050 per week and you look at what you can rent for $1,050 a week, it's a completely different picture. You're pretty much getting the most executive house on offer in Cairns for around $1,000 a week. But you can't rent the $1,000 a week house for a two-month contract. They don't want to know about you. So they approached mm -hmm. us and basically went, we know you've got a heap of people that invest in property, a lot of landlords. Would anyone be interested in basically renting out their property for this 150 a night, we can't find somewhere to put her. And that basically opened up our world to the opportunity that is. Yeah, that's, wow. so you sort of almost stumbled upon it by the sounds of it. Yeah, pretty much got thrown at us is probably the best way to look at it. He just, yeah, called me and he's like, we've got this opportunity. Do you want to take it? And the money was was too good that we essentially found a way to, to accommodate this lady. And she was with us for, for three months, this nurse. Um, at 1,050 a, a week for, and we put her into a property that probably would have rented for somewhere around 300, if that. Um, so we went from a, a property that was returning somewhere around 300 to 1,050. Yeah, that's an incredible yield. <laughs> correct, <laughs> correct, correct. So that's where we were really starting to went. Well, hold on, if this is just one one case, how come they can't find her something around that sort of 150 mark and. That's where we really started to dive into the, the market and the opportunities. So what, what does that mean? What does that look like for you guys? So you kicked off with your own Airbnb to like, you were like, cool, we're going to service her. We've got property as you, so you started to build a portfolio. Um, what yeah, what does it look like? Yeah. So essentially we converted three of our own residential properties over into, into short-term rentals. And just to sort of put a definition on it, early in this sort of conversation, when we talk Airbnb, Airbnb is one platform, but what we're really talking is short-term rentals. So short-term rentals is, is up, to, up to six weeks, and then you sort of move into a mid-term rental of what I'd sort of consider mid-term, which is 
sort of from that that one to two months through to sort of four to five months mm-hmm. um, is your is your midterm rentals. So that's sort of yeah, as much as Airbnb is the the headline there, it's really that short term rental market, and that comes from a whole heap of different platforms and a lot of direct deals as well, like that hospital deal that was direct with the hospital to us. It wasn't through wow. Airbnb or another platform. Okay. So, then, um, so, so they then when you're direct, there's no fees whatsoever. Like you don't have to correct. deal with it at all. Yeah. With, We're not uh, losing the, the fees to the, the platform. But that's essentially what got us into it. We moved three of our own properties over onto the Airbnb market. And then we really saw the opportunity there in a hole in the market where there was management offers and people were offering to manage it, but it just felt like something that could be vastly improved on to, to what was on offer. And that's something we've sort of come into this space and taken a lot of pride in sort of changing what, what is on offer. Yeah. Yeah. And the fundamental so, difference between $300 and $1,500, like that's going to massively pay down the debt on your, your like talking about the commercial cash flow returns of, what was it, 5 to 8%, like that, that's unreal. Have you is it, calculated the yield or, or am, I, am I jumping ahead, Jeff? No, no, you're not jumping ahead at all. So essentially for properties located in the right location, as a general rule of thumb, you're either doubling or tripling the residential rent. Um, but there is higher fees along with that. There is additional outgoings, which I'm sure we'll get to. Um, but as a as a gross looking sort of figure, you are for a property in the right location. I really stress right location there. You're at least doubling or tripling the the residential rents. Yeah, well, that that dovetails quite nicely into um, what I was sort of going to ask next is how how do how do people identify what works for an Airbnb property? Yeah. Probably the best thing to do to start to sort of identify what returns you might be able to get or if a property will work at all yep. is sort of no different to if you're looking at working out what a property is worth to sell or if what a property is worth on the residential rental market. You mm-hmm. essentially need to do a bit of a, a market analysis. Jump onto, obviously, we're talking short term rentals, so jumping onto Airbnb and finding properties similar to yours. You're never going to find something, you might, but very rarely will you find something exactly the same. But I recommend looking for one that's maybe slightly better and one that's slightly worse. And that's going to start to give you your range of sort of your upper end of the market to the lower end of what that property might be able to achieve. And just by looking through Airbnb, looking through the map, you'll start to see some comparable properties. And that's going to start to give you a bit of a, a ballpark. But that does only give sort of 50% of the picture. Obviously, with the, the short-term rentals, you've got that combination of your nightly rate plus your occupancy rate. And you need both to be strong to actually make it work. Ooh. So, so what's that? What's the so nightly rate? That makes sense. One hundred and fifty bucks a night. What's the occupancy rate? Yeah. So obviously, like with a long term rental, you put a tenant in there for for twelve months. Mm-hmm. They're in there for a twelve month lease. The chances are they might stay in that property for three, four, five years. In the current rental market that we've got, no one probably really looks at occupancy rates because you're pretty much guaranteed one hundred percent occupancy for a long term rental. Mm-hmm. Where for a short term rental, depending on your location, you know, you might be somewhere that say like Phillip Island in Victoria, you might absolutely go crazy in the school holidays and when the motorbike races are on, you might get absolutely insane rates, but then half the year your property might sit vacant. So you need to factor in. Phillip Island is miserable winter. Like I've, I've, got, I've got relatives down that way and it's, it's it, even in summer, like you can go there and it'd be like 12 degrees and absolutely, it's, the penguins are beautiful, but yeah. I, <laughs> penguins and motorbikes. Yeah, yeah. But, what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> Um, But yeah, so depending on the the market, you need to sort of work out the seasonality of that market. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. There is a few different websites like AirDNA will give you that seasonality and give you a bit of an idea of what periods are getting what prices. And the other way to do it is to find a property on Airbnb similar to yours, click on their calendar and it will show you what available days they've got coming up. And Anything sort of three, four months in advance, I'd probably expect that to sit sort of empty anyway. Um, but the stuff coming up in the next four to five weeks, if that calendar looks really solid and there's not many available days, that will start to give you a bit of an, a bit of an idea of the occupancy rate that you might be able to achieve. Yeah. Are there any areas that are just, just any, just not good for Airbnb? Like just don't even think about having an Airbnb around yeah. here. So I've got a a couple of properties up here in Cairns and there's some that we've already switched over to the Airbnb market and we didn't hesitate to switch over and there's some that we just wouldn't even consider. 
I think is a, and that probably goes for, for a lot of towns across Australia. There's certainly good parts of towns and there's other parts of town that if you're not familiar with it and you were to turn up and realise you're in a, you know, a pretty rough area, you're going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to leave terrible reviews. It's going to tarnish that property very quickly. So I think anything that's in sort of C or D grade areas, you really need to think twice before you throw an Airbnb as yeah. If it's not somewhere that, you know, locals with long-term rentals, they know that area, they're prepared to pay X price to live in that area. But someone traveling from interstate to arrive to a pretty rough area, you might find it's not going to be favorable in the long run. Yeah, yeah. The interesting thing that I've, because I was thinking about this, because do are there people out there that go specifically or, or come to you, they're probably reaching out now, to come and ask you to buy, or not buy, but help them identify a property that, works off the bat with Airbnb or is it mostly people converting existing properties? What do you find? Nah, absolutely. So it's probably 50-50 at the moment, 50% um, people converting and 50% people using buyer's agents that are reaching out to us in Cairns or yep. buying and looking at setting it up as an Airbnb from the get-go. So there's certainly that, that combination. Um, yep. And that's where, you know, if you're looking at buying on the Gold Coast in Sydney, in Melbourne and doing Airbnb, See if you can find a good, reliable manager down there and they will be able to give you some insights as well into seasonality and, and likely returns. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, um, it's, it's the sort of thing you we were talking about just before the show about um, returns and, and where it sort of sits in a portfolio. We, we won't go down that rabbit hole because we, we could. We could talk for, talk for hours. But um, where, where I wanted to, where we could probably go next with this is, is sort of looking at now that you have identified sort of what works in an Airbnb and, and the types of locations and all that sort of thing. Uh, and I'm sure if people got questioned that, please throw those in. Um, how do you, how do you then sort of, what sort of processes do, do you need to have in place with, with an Airbnb? Like how do you actually go from, yeah, you got the property, what do you do next? Yep. So you've got the property that's sort of obviously step one, I guess, is that researching, working out what property you should be buying um no different to to buying it as a permanent rental there's always credit in being patient and finding that property that is a good deal and not just rushing in and buying the first one you see so i think that's important to sort of point out regardless of the the purpose be it if you're buying commercial real estate residential real estate short-term real estate being patient and finding that right deal you're going to make a lot of capital straight off the the bat regardless of the market so that's step one is research know your market find the property that's suitable. The second stage is setting it up. And that's where coming in and furnishing it, getting the right decor and really presenting it well makes such a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. If it's all right, I might show maybe even an example of a couple that we've just set up. Let's do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, whilst, whilst, you're, whilst you're doing that, can I can I ask you to multitask? I, I, I yeah, know. Yeah. Maybe. You mentioned one red, one sort of thing mistake people make is buying C and D errors. What, what are some of the other mistakes that red flags that people should when they're looking to buy an Airbnb? Looking at buying an Airbnb, red flag. So I guess, you know, like I said, patience and finding that, that right deal. Yeah. Um, looking at the nightly rates at the wrong period. So if you're jumping in and looking at the nightly rates mm -hmm. when the AFL is on in Melbourne or like middle of winter and, you know, in an area that, does really well in winter and forgetting that it's completely seasonable like you might you know the snow fields or maybe somewhere in summer that's you know there's no tourists go to in winter looking at those seasonality and not factoring in the full year i guess is a, a bit of a, a trap for young players so just sort of being conscious of that and realizing the seasonality of where you're buying into just to make sure it actually works the whole year round and you're not just being lured in by a by a shiny return for a moment in time yeah, and then that's going to cause someone to overpay on a on a property and say, you know what, I can spend an extra twenty thousand because I'm going to get an extra X in rent, and then it just doesn't. It's not reality. It's you're going to get an extra two weeks worth of rent for that period, yeah. and then it just drops off the cliff. To yeah, a more correct. Normal. So that's yeah. a, a big part of it. But I'll just jump in and I'll share my sure. screen. Um, I just want to show a couple of properties that we've set up. Um, so this is one that we've set up. This is one that we own ourselves. Um, and this is the one that we actually originally rented out for the $150 per, per night. Do you want to zoom in a bit? Oh, can we? I don't know. Can we? Oh, for, the, for those watching the podcast or listening to the podcast, you have to go over to YouTube or check it out on YouTube. Uh -oh. 
Can we see? Oh, now I've definitely cooked it. All right, let's jump into another one. Um, <laughs> can we see this? I can see yeah. it's big enough. Let's not try and zoom. <laughs> okay, let's not try and zoom. So this is one. Wow, look, at that, look at that view. Is that water? This is water. This is so I'm going to show. So this is the property when they first bought it. Ooh. Um, Warts and all here we're seeing. Warts and all. So this is when they first bought it. The view sensational. The view hasn't changed. Yep. Um, but you <laughs> get an idea that. of how sexy that couch is. Wow. The, <laughs> Wonder the, how many. The stories that couch could tell. If so this was. Cool. They, they originally set this up. Uh, so they bought this and it come fully furnished. They could have kept all this furniture. Mm -hmm. Our <laughs> advice, obviously, was to not keep all the furniture. Um, the directly well made here. But we essentially took it on and just modernized the furniture. So just light bright. We like to include a lot of greenery in the photos and into the into the properties. It just makes them really pop on on Airbnb. Um, use the same, but you just sort of get an idea with the artwork, the greenery, um, new furniture in this one. This one I think costs somewhere around twenty grand for them to to set this up and fully furnish it out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see if I can reload this one because this is one that we did and that's if you can furnish them the, yourself you're going to save a lot of money um so this one we did with pretty much predominantly secondhand furniture so mm -hmm. off facebook marketplace off gumtree and i think we furnished this one for about three and a half thousand so you can do it a lot cheaper um once again just the decor the green plants really trying to make it stand out amongst the other listings. And I think professional photography is such a big one as well when setting them up just to make them look super clean, super attractive, make them look like something people would want to stay in. That gives you... How, how important is the copy? Um, so the words of the, of the um, thing, of the ad, like is it all just yep. purely images and don't worry too much about the words about what you're saying or... So I've done real estate sales for ever and a day, and I'm convinced that no one reads the copy. And I don't think that's... <laughs> you would be surprised. Different. I read the copy. You read the copy. I, 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 I laugh at it as well. It's like, oh, did, did, did they hand this out to a, a fourth, a, a year four, a fourth grade student to write this? I was like, Ugh. They all know no one a, reads it. I think there's some important factors like how big the block is, how many bed, how many bar. But the majority of the copy, I think, as an agent, a sales agent for so long, we were really writing it to keep our vendors happy, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah. The, it, I, I, I could be wrong. Tell me if you think I'm wrong, but I think the copy doesn't actually play too much of a, a part in part in everything. The photos tell the story and the photos are, are crucial. And I think that that's what you just said there tells the story is a big part of what you're trying to do. You're trying to paint the picture of someone living their, living a holiday lifestyle and what do people want to be surrounded by? They want to be surrounded by water. They want to be surrounded by nice green, like nature. Um, and you create that atmosphere there. Yeah. And I think that's the big, really important part with Airbnb. So with residential sales and with residential rentals, the vast majority of either buyers or tenants are actually inspecting the properties. So if your photos are so-so, your decor is so-so, the majority of people will still come and have a look at it. It's four bed, three bath, it's got the pool. They're going to turn up and have a look and see if that <laughs> property is suitable for them. Where when you're booking accommodation, be it in Bali, be it Australia, be it Sydney, Melbourne, wherever, you're literally online shopping. You're basing your sole purchasing decision on what you can see online. And that's where the photos and how we display the properties online is just so crucial. Yeah, I've, I've got an interesting and, and maybe it's too technical. And um, if, if I'm getting too technical, audience, let me know. But I, I want when you when you're looking at your Airbnbs, do you are you have you set up a, a type of demographic like a persona? That, have you done that deliberately? Mm. Like, how have you looked into that? So it very much depends on the property. So we've got probably a similar recipe and decor and way we present pretty much every property. Yeah. Um, like I think we've almost got the same dining table, coffee table and fake plants in nearly every home. Okay. They're price conscious. They're really cheap. The coffee tables and dining tables that we buy, they clean really well. And yeah. then the fake plants just pop really well. So 
for for the majority, we're using a similar recipe that just seems to be drawing a, a really wide audience. I don't know if it was off air or on air, but there was a question asked to Joe about what color he should paint a building or something, and the inside or the inside of the building, and the answer was just white, white, white. I think oh. if you can if you can make something appeal to the widest audience, that's obviously going to be be beneficial. I think I remember that. Yeah. I, I saw that one, yeah. And then it was, yeah, I do remember that one. That, that, that <laughs> post got it. It's interesting. One. The um, the thing I was because talking to that about the demo, uh, the the persona or the, the sort of um, person who's going to look at it or, or state your properties. The thing that uh, came up as one as an objection is that there's there's all these party hooligans that are going to stay and make make loud music and loud noise. So how do you how do you handle that? Have you ever had a situation like that? And how do you handle that? So a couple of things uh, that we do to protect our, our landlords. First of all is we collect the guest's ID. So government-issued ID we collect and we form and we secure basically through our software. And we also yeah. collect credit card details. Those two things in it of itself isn't going to stop someone, but it might make them think twice. It's a little bit of a deterrent. They've got the credit card details. They know exactly who I am and who's staying in the property. Mm-hmm. So that's first and foremost. Secondly, our neighbours, whoever lives next to the property, we're giving our number to. We're making it very wow. clear who manages the property, who looks after the property. We're not <laughs> trying to hide from them. Mm-hmm. And they're very, very quick to call if someone's not doing the right thing at a property. And then it's just a matter of having that conversation and getting on the, the front foot early. But the reality is, regardless of who you live next door to, like is a, in a residential area, someone's going to throw that 30th, that 40th, that 50th birthday from time to time. And yep. (laughs) so like with the Airbnb properties, the risk of someone being noisy and a hooligan, I think it's probably less likely than just having a normal neighbor that throws that shindig once, twice, three, four every weekend. Um, So, yeah. I don't know if I'm jumping on that bandwagon. I think, I think, (laughs) A lot of the Airbnbs I've been to are because we're having a, a Bucks night or a, a big birthday or a big party. Um, so I don't know. I'm not so I sure. Think that, I think that's why usually with an Airbnb, when I, when I book one, I usually, or other people, book, they book it sort of somewhat out in the country. Like I, I probably yeah. wouldn't go and book one that's like in the in I wouldn't book a conference. unit. You definitely, yeah, exactly. You're not going to book it in an apartment. It's going to be conference. very obvious. Um, yeah, but yeah, also, fine. actually, one thing that, that to talking like that, talking about, you know, booking a big group is the amount of times when you did have a, so, you know, someone hosting it, I would call you up, Sean, and say, hey, Sean, um, we want to book this place. We've got 12 people. And you're like, <laughs> no, you're not coming. <laughs> you get you get knocked down because people don't want that kind of party at their place because obviously it, it upsets yeah. everybody. Correct. Yeah. And that's where, you know, those remote properties and I've stayed in a lot of Airbnbs myself and it's probably no different to, you know, being at home. You are that level of respectable. You, you're not going to, you know, and most people are very respectful. They, they might have music on till 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, but, you know, be it at home or be it in an Airbnb, if you've got music blaring at 1am, you're probably going to get a knock on your door at some point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think this is a great little question. Oh, that, damn it. I was um, about to bring that up, Joe. Sorry. Beat you to it. <laughs> Well, Billy, Billy, Billy Ann is, is all over it. Um, so I'd love to hear what essentials you think you need to have in an Airbnb. Tea, milk, coffee, wine, bathroom um, es- essentials, all of those type of things. Because those are the things the that wine. when you do go and you don't have milk or you don't have tea bags, it's like, oh, God, wouldn't it, would I have to go to the shops? Like, oh, here we go. And Billy is a, uh, a fellow Airbnb owner. Awesome. Love it. Beautiful. <laughs> what are some of the essentials? And are those essentials behind you right now? Those essentials the- are behind me. We well and truly yeah. keep stock of our tea, milk, sugar, coffee, toilet paper. Um, big ones, obviously, the internet. Everyone expects internet no matter mm-hmm. where they go. Like it, it's probably not even needing to be said, but internet's certainly something that, that you need to make sure the property's got a nice, reliable internet connection. A lot of people are working while on holidays, so making sure that's functioning properly and functioning how it should it will rule out a lot of sort of guest communication and, and problems that don't need to be. But then your, your basic essentials is exactly what Joe said, what you would expect. If you were going on holidays, what you need to get through that five, six, seven, eight days and supplying enough of it. So toilet paper, we normally try and account. If someone's in the property for, for a week, we make sure there's enough 
toilet paper for however many people there are for a week. Tea, coffee, milk, similar story. We're really trying to to supply enough for that person to get through without needing to go to the shops to get those basic essentials. And, and getting mm. getting into the real nitty gritty because I've stayed at a couple of Airbnbs and it's literally almost been a granny flat out the back and they haven't got the I want to say granny flat it's almost been like a single room they haven't got things like a stove or haven't got the the sort of so do you find that those sort of properties don't work so well as well of an Airbnb? I think it comes back to expectations and price point. Okay. You know, if you're going somewhere and you know the average accommodation is somewhere around two hundred dollars a night. And you're paying a hundred dollars a night, but you know what you're getting yourself into. You, you know, you're aware there's no kitchen facilities. You're yeah. aware you're just getting a room. Okay. It, it's all all price driven at the end of the day. Price driven and expectations. Where if you're paying, you know, a thousand dollars a night, you're probably going to expect there's some pretty good frying pans, definitely a toaster, yeah. so on and so <laughs> forth. Yeah. Um, what what are some of what are some of the little the little extras that you can do to spice things up for people? Like, are there things that you just think? Oh, actually, I didn't even think like a bottle of wine or or what? Are, are there any like extras that go the extra mile for people that are trying to rent this? It's so funny. We include bottles of water. So no matter depending on how many guests yeah. there are, we include bottles of water, a packet of just chips, like just potato chips, and a yeah. packet of Oreos. And the oh, amount yeah. of like positive feedback that we get over something, I think it's like we get it in bulk. And I think it's yeah. like four dollars worth of stuff that we provide. And the amount of like oh, positive people. feedback is just obscene. So just yeah. providing that. And I think while the wine's great and providing wine and alcohol, the majority of people have just got off an aeroplane, just got out of a taxi, they're either hungry or thirsty or both. And yeah. I think that goes a lot more, has a lot more mileage to it, providing a couple of snacks and some bottles of cold water. People seem yep. to be really grateful for. Yeah, yeah and, I, I think the and, risk, the risk you run with alcohol is is in a in a in, a, in 2023, there are more and more people that, that aren't necessarily drinking. So I think, I mean, yeah. I suppose no harm, but yeah. But even like the, you've got the people that don't drink. But if you're spending less than maybe $20 on a bottle of wine, the chances are it's going to be pretty shitty and not to someone's liking anyway. So yeah. that's where Oreos, chips and water, like you sort of can't go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and it's only five and it's only five bucks. Yeah. Um, Correct. One thing is the little touches for the area as well. Not that I'm an Airbnb expert, but some of the things that I've enjoyed. So I stayed in Airbnb in the Blue Mountains in winter, freezing cold. And uh, they had a handwritten note and said, you know, have a look in this, you know, in the cupboard, there's all these jackets for you. Because I imagine you've come from Sydney, not expecting it to be so cold. And then we left the most amazing review for these people because they thought about the challenges that we would have and provided some, some little extra service of, of jackets because it's going to be cold for you. Yep. Yeah. That's absolutely so, brilliant. And something so simple too. Yeah. Like boogie boards. Like if you're near the beach, can you provide boogie boards? Hey, the kids might want to go for a little surf. Probably the only challenge once you start providing, and that's something like we've wanted to do, like bicycles, stand-up paddle boards, and that sort of stuff, is it does become a litigation nightmare. Oh, if yeah. How, how do you actually how do you get around that? Like, what, do you have to have public liability? We, or? We've just put it in the too hard basket, bicycles, sporting equipment, any of that stuff. Um, we know we've got insurance for the property. We know what that insurance entails when it comes to the property. But as soon as you start providing stuff, like exercise equipment, it's something we've chosen to steer away from. And I think it's something that I'd recommend the vast majority of people to at least chat to their insurance provider or just put it in the too hard basket. As much as it would be mm. lovely to provide it, the risk of someone choking themselves on a jacket you've provided is very slim. And I think that's, a, you know, I think that's a, a great, great inclusion where suddenly the brakes don't work on the bicycle and they get hit by a car. It's just a game I'd rather not play. Yeah. yeah on, on that so on that point about insurance, how, is there are there companies that are Airbnb, Airbnb specialists, or I suppose if you don't want to mention companies, what what should what sort of things should people look for? Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, you need to approach your insurance provider and let them know that you're doing short term. Um, I would go as far to say the vast majority of insurers won't actually insure your property once you're doing a short term rental on it. They just Ooh. Like even up here, it's interesting if you're using your property as a short-term rental and you're with certain insurers and a cyclone comes through, they won't insure you for the cyclone because you're using it as a short-term rental. 
So you do <laughs> you do need to to check that your insurer will actually cover it. And there's a number of insurers will, that will. It's not like it's a super niche thing that we're doing. There is, you know, a dozen or so really good quality insurance companies out there that will offer policies. It's just a matter of asking the right people or, or going out there and approaching an insurance broker to, to make sure your policy actually covers you. Yeah, yeah like this sure, is probably funny. one situation where I would go to insurance broker and just say, if you're looking to if you're going to do one, but if you're going to do more than one, I'd say it's worth the kind of yep. getting an expert on board. Insurance for the for apartments, so if you're, you're buying a, an apartment to Airbnb, the policy is actually very comparable to landlord insurance. So Terry Shear is one, one such provider. I know that they're Australia-wide for, for landlord insurance. I think they charge somewhere around $350 for a residential policy. And for a short-term policy, I think they're $390. So it's really much of a muchness in the grand scheme of things for apartments and, and units. Um, for houses, when you're looking at house and contents and landlord insurance, the policies are slightly more expensive for, for short term versus long term. Yeah, and and um, I guess one of the other things there's a no uh, was there was a comment up here somewhere about um, like wear and tear. How do you kind of factor that in? Um, let me just try and find the question. Yeah, here. so to cover off on on wear and tear. The properties get cleaned at least once a week. If not most times, they're getting cleaned twice a week. I'd almost argue that the wear and tear on the properties is less than a long-term long -term rental just because they are getting cleaned and the little bits of maintenance are happening so regularly. And the upside of that as well is if you ever need a bank valuation, the properties are presenting immaculately. It's not like you're going into a tenanted property where the tenant's been in there for three years, there's crap everywhere, dishes Singles. in the sinks, beds unmade. And as much as that shouldn't sway a valuer, I very much know that a property presented while looking at its very best is going to value considerably better than something that's tenanted and not presented well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to chat to was we've been talking about, you know, well, self. let's talk about self-rental versus using a, a, a property manager. Like what... So self-managing, you mean, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Self -managing. Self -managing. yeah. So if I, so I've got a, you know, a, a, a unit in Cronulla, for instance. I think it would make an amazing Airbnb. I'm just gonna, you know, I've, I've, no, I've been to Airbnb. I'll just put it on Airbnb. Um, yep. Like, why would I use a, a property manager instead of not just doing it all myself? Yep. So a couple of ways to look at that. Firstly, when you take your property from the long-term rental market into the short-term rental market. You're very much changing the use. You're turning it from a home into a hospitality business. So it's very much you're turning into a, a hotel for all intensive purposes. So in regards to 24-7 to guest communication because the internet's not working at 3 a.m., in regards to the cleanliness of the property, regards to the linen and the changeover, all of that is very much something that, that a lot of people can do, but it is a lot of work and you'd need to be based very much local to the property and on call 24 seven. And that's something as in, as one property, it's a whole lot of work to do for just one, where once you start getting a portfolio <clears> in <throat> 10, 20, 30, it's suddenly just economies of scale and it works quite well to be on call 24 seven for that sheer number of properties versus uh, an owner just needing to do it for one, organizing the cleaners and everything else that comes with it, running that hospitality business for just one property. So that is actually a good – finding a cleaner is super hard. The it bloody question, is. It's ridiculous. Like, I couldn't get somebody to – everybody's booked out. Don't do it, Joe. You'll pull your hair out. Look, people are, people, are, people are having a go at me. I've done something here, but that's actually – No, no, really they're looking out for you, Joe. They're looking out for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're looking out. That's a good way to put it. Um, <laughs> is, the, the, is a cleaner going to say, you know what, I'm going to speak to Joe, who's some this, some random guy that's just do, trying to self-manage, or am I going to go to the guy that has 50 and I'm going to have consistent work throughout all of the town and I'll just clean, 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 and I'll have my schedule, whereas Joe will just kind of call me when he needs me and he's really difficult to deal with because he's never dealt with hospitality before and he doesn't, yeah. So maybe the cleaners are hard to find because you're not as attractive. And that's probably one of the biggest comments with people in Airbnbs and people that are self-managing is how hard it is to find the cleaners. Where we've got a team of in-house cleaners, so people that we hire directly 
um, that we provide all the equipment for that then they can go out. And that's where a good Airbnb management team will have their, their in-house cleaners or their contract cleaners that they work exclusively with so that they can provide that service. And that consistent service versus your cleaner being hit and miss and sometimes available and suddenly your cleaner's sick and you've only got one cleaner, so then you're out there scrubbing the toilet rather than the cleaner doing it. So there's certainly, certainly appeal there from a management point of view. And it very much is very intensive compared to your residential long-term management, but it all comes factored into to the costs. And maybe that's a good segue into see a lot of people in the comments asking about the the outgoings and what what the actual cost is of running a, an Airbnb property versus a, a long-term. Yeah, before we talk about returns, because yeah. I, I want to know returns and about outgoings. Can I can I ask you if if somebody and, and you are one of these providers? So of, of course. Um, it needs to be taken into consideration. But how yep. does somebody, if I'm talking to an Airbnb specialist property manager, what are some of the questions I should be asking these people? Yeah, yep, absolutely. I think with interviewing anyone for any service, the biggest danger is not knowing what you don't know. You know, be it your, your mechanic or, or whoever, if you actually just have no idea about what you're actually getting them to do, it can be a, a dangerous space. So doing a little bit of research, maybe watching some YouTube videos, listening to your podcast like this and getting a general basis of knowledge is certainly going to help you when it comes time to interview people. Yep. And then when it comes time to interview, a couple of really good questions I'd be asking is around like pricing strategy, whether they run like a stagnant pricing where they just have the same price year round. If it books, it books, it doesn't, it doesn't. Or more a dynamic pricing where they're adjusting the pricing constantly depending on the seasons, depending on how soon those vacancies are coming up. So pricing is a big one. Looking at their marketing, so jumping onto their Airbnb profile, how do their properties present? Would you want to stay at their properties? And how are their reviews? Very quickly, you'll learn if their cleaners are doing a good job or not through the Airbnb reviews. If, you, if they're getting reviews that their cleaners are doing a shit job, if they're hard to communicate with, that's going to be a red flag in and of itself. Yeah, a surprising and, thing that people um is behind the like people really get fancy about things behind the like behind the toilet like actually kind of not being clean like I'm I, I'm like people actually <laughs> think and think and worry about that like I just, I've just been amazed I've looked at some Airbnb stuff and it's like wow that's crazy yeah and that's probably you know a really good thing is just how transparent the reviews are on Airbnb so if you are looking at hiring a manager you can very much look at their reviews and that's going to tell a, a big part of the story if, if they're any good or not. Can you, can you hide or can you sort of... Oh, so it is definitely transparent. You can't sort of delete or you can't... Yeah, um, no, nothing you can do. Not, very much like Google reviews. I don't think you can delete them unless there's actual grounds to get them deleted. Yeah, which is pretty um, hard. But yeah, yeah. Nice. Just sort of, yeah, with Airbnb, it's very transparent with the reviews. Can, can I ask a question about dynamic versus um, stagnant sort of pricing? I would imagine that dynamic pricing is probably better. Um, but the dynamic pricing, would you, would you go a step further and ask the Airbnb manager how they've come up with that number or was that? Just yeah, absolutely. I'd be, they should be able to give you some sort of explanation around their pricing strategies yep. and they might not be able to give you an exact dollar from day to day of what that property is going to do, but they should have some sort of plan in, pla in place for pricing. So for instance, for us, we can go into our calendar and we set the school holiday pricing two years in advance. We go in and go for school holidays, we're going to increase our rates here, here, here. For winter, which is our high season, we're increasing our rates. For special events, like the we have the, the Ironman that comes to Cairns once a year and basically town books out for that weekend. We're going in and increasing the, the rates for those days. So that's sort of set up from the get-go. And then as the dates close in, so obviously it's a pretty perishable item in the fact that if a property sits vacant for a night, you can't go get that money back. It's It's gone. Yep. So when properties uh, vacancies are coming up within three, week, three weeks, we start to reduce our prices. We reduce our prices at two weeks. We reduce our prices at one week. So we're being very active with the pricing just to make sure we're getting every single dollar out of the properties. Is that all manual or automatic? Pretty much, like... pretty much manual. Um, it is manual. It's very much you can, manual. You could probably say for it, Joe. I'm sure you could. Yeah. You could, just, you could automate it, mate. I don't know. You could automate yeah. it. The yeah. thing is like... For nearly, for, for every property, there's a price that I know that will book out no matter what. So if I drop something that's, you know, available in two nights time down to X, I know at that price it will book. You know, if it's normally a $300 a night property and I drop it to 150, I know without a doubt I'm going to fill that day. 
So it's yeah. just a matter of finding that sweet spot across the board. So there's no way I'm going to be sitting at eight o'clock at night looking at different comparable Airbnbs to think, you know what, actually, this is a bit vacant. I should drop it $20. There's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where like if you've got, say you've got one, one property that you're self-managing on Airbnb, you're going to start to just learn at X price this books no matter what. Mm. So without even looking at the comparables, you'll just start to know at $200, I might fill 60% of my calendar. I'll then have four-day gaps in the calendar where if I drop them to this price, I know that they're going to book. So you do start mm. to just sort of recognize those, those trends for each property. And I, I think as well, if you're going to self-manage, it sounds like you the type of person that's going to do that needs to be very organized and, and quite meticulous yeah. because if you've got, if, if you've missed that there's a, a, an Iron Man coming up and, or if you don't know right. that, yeah. then, then mm -hmm. somebody, you, you, might, you might keep it at that rate and then you, and you might miss out on, I don't know, three, four, six, a thousand dollars for that week. Yeah, absolutely. So like in our local market up here, we've got properties that book for $300 a night during the off season and that'll go up to 650 in the high season. So it's like chalk and cheese. Like, But obviously you, you still want to make sure you're getting bookings in the off season. So we're dropping it to 300 and keeping that sort of consistent occupancy rate, but then just really making, making the cream during the busy times. And yeah. what would those type of properties rent for on the normal market themselves, like every single week normally? So... For instance, the property that I showed on the Esplanade with the ocean views, something like that would rent for somewhere around six fifty per per week um, on the residential market, and that property very easily will do around two thousand four hundred, two thousand five hundred a, a week on the the Airbnb market. But that's a prime example of it's the perfect location for Airbnb. It's the perfect setup, like it's three bed, two bath. It's in the right location. That one's just an absolute no-brainer to have it on the Airbnb market versus having it on the, the residential market. Yeah, nice. Um, should we um should we talk about returns now, Joe? Should we wait to yes. maybe we'll wait till after the break? Yeah, so we'll have a quick break, but I want to chat to returns. I want to chat to the numbers. I want to look at have you got any spreadsheets or I mean very much jumping this. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have any spreadsheets ready to roll, but that's all right. We can talk to numbers. Should have asked that before the show. Yeah, anyway. Should have asked that before. That is our fault. But um, yeah, let's jump into our sponsor posts and then explore. This live session is sponsored by Scott Agate from Hello House. Scott has created the world's first property negotiation as a service business. So what does that mean? Well, let's think about it. When was the last time you negotiated on anything over $100, let alone a property that is going to be one of the biggest investments of your life? The vendor, they have a trained negotiator on their side in the form of a real estate agent. That's kind of like you stepping into the ring with Mike Tyson after never training a day of boxing in your life. These guys are trained professionals and that's what they do day in and day out. And this is what Hello House does every single day as well. They negotiate on property to get the best buy price from the real estate agents. Scott Agate, he's the expert negotiator. He has been in this industry since 1995. He owned and operated three Bell franchises. Scott was the guy that was teaching these real estate agents all these agent games. He knows all of their tricks. Having him on your side is going to give you a massive unfair advantage and literally save you tens of thousands of dollars. Unlike other ways of purchasing property, Scott's incentives are aligned with you, the buyer, meaning the more money he saves you, the more money he makes, which is what you want. You need to have those incentives aligned. Scott has kindly offered our group a massive discount on the retainer fee for his service. So if you're looking to buy your next home or investment property, click the link below to get in touch. Oh, Brian has, has asked if the, I think he wants to buy the property next door to that one that's renting for two, two and a half thousand or 2,400 a week. So if you, if you know anybody selling, Sean, you, you may be getting, getting, I mean, probably not, but yeah, um, yeah that's interesting. So, around. There's no, no shortage of those apartments. Yeah. Interesting. Before we move on to returns, I might just well, that one that I, I highlighted on the Esplanade there, and a, a lot of properties in Cairns are zoned for short-term rentals. So mm -hmm. I know there's a, a bit of a, a political debate, you know, around the Airbnb space. If you are looking yeah. at buying something rather than converting something you already own, it's definitely worth considering what the zoning is on the property. And if it is zoned for short-term use, that's very attractive because it's basically it's being used for 
the correct zoning, there's really nothing, no way that can get messed with into the future. And if yeah. the government does ever really change the Airbnb dynamics, those ones that are zoned for short-term rentals will really go through the roof return-wise. So zoning for short-term rentals, like I'm sure every state is not on top of that that stuff. How much zone, like is there a zoning in Cairns for short-term rentals? So well, in before. regards to every state is different. So New South Wales does have a 180-day limit um, for, for regional, for the Sydney greater area. You can only rent your property on the short-term market for 180 days. Queensland is by far one of the more relaxed states. You can pretty much Airbnb anything for as long as you want, and there's no real policies around that at this moment in time. Um, but it is something worth considering is, you know, if there is likely to be changes into the future and what that might look like. And that's mm -hmm. where I think some of those properties that are zoned for short-term letting are very appealing, especially looking into the future. They're, they're worth their weight in gold because they are zoned correctly. Yeah, um, what, one, one thing that you pointed out uh, that with those pictures were that all of them were units. What about, like, what's the perfect property types for Airbnb? Is there a specific three-bed, two-bath, one, you know, two-bed, one-bath, three-bed, two-bath um, houses, large houses, lots of land? Like, what, what looks good? What works? Yeah, so if we're looking at the short-term rental market just purely as a cash flow play, that's where the apartments are so attractive. We've got apartments in basically the Cairns City that were somewhere around that sort of 350, 400,000 that are getting a better cash flow than houses worth over a million dollars out of the city a little bit. So the, the units are very attractive, but that's mainly because of the location of the units. If you had a house right in the CBD, it would do very well, but you're obviously paying a lot more for a house right in the middle of the CBD than you would an apartment. And then the returns would be pretty comparable. So from a, yeah, so you're kind of saying like there needs to be a reason why people come to your area. Why people come to Cronulla, for instance, is a beautiful beach. Why people go to Cairns, beautiful, beautiful waterfront views. They don't go into the, the back over the hills. Yep. Don't put an Airbnb there. Put, get to where the star attraction is or get as close to that is as possible. If you can have and afford a house, go there. But if you can't, a unit may be a better way. So a couple of things are also worth considering. So if you are, if it is a house and it is out of the main sort of location, Cairns, obviously our CBD, Cronulla, you know, closer to the beachfront, the better. If you're out of that location, the property needs to become a destination in and of itself. If you've got amazing house with beautiful pools and, you know, a tennis court and bars and saunas, then the house becomes a destination and people don't need to leave the house and then they'll book it. So if the... Yeah. If the location doesn't have all that stuff on, you know, if the location isn't the best, if the house does have that destination feel, you will get bookings. Yeah, there you go. That now, now we're talking. Um, another great question that's come up is strata how do we get around strata rules? Um, yeah. Does this come up? You're in, you're in a, you know, you're in a unit with strata. You got to do what they, do what they say. Bylaws or whatever. Yeah, so I'll only speak to Queensland here just because I'm not familiar with how the other states operate. But yeah, in Queensland, right. the strata can't control what you do inside your unit. So the, the, the strata is very, very yeah. limited in what they, they can do. In regards to, to whether it's short term or long term, if you're running a business out of it, then the strata probably has a foot to stand on. Um, but there's been a number of court cases in Queensland where the strata has tried to stop people from doing short term letting and they failed when it went to court. So... It's, yeah, very, very unlikely the strata will be able to put a stop to it. Um, certainly, it hasn't, hasn't happened in Queensland so far. It seems like that seems yeah. like the type of thing that in, in New South or Sydney in particular, because I imagine, yeah, some, some people would be um, some strata because there'd be some powerful people on, on, on the strata, or not just people who are annoying, really. Or well, not annoying, but they, they have. Yeah, yeah no, 100%. That's the, the problem with strata, be it whether you're living there or short term renting it or long term renting it is the other owners and that's probably no different to a house you know if you've got a terrible neighbor next door that's constantly whinging about stuff it's going to make anything hard regardless of what you do with the property yeah, yeah. great comment here target your audience lifestyle and holiday or people traveling uh traveling for work um that's super interesting is there a floor plan that that lays lends itself to be a better a better layout like um yeah yeah so the 
cover off on that question in regards to people traveling for work we've got some units that are basically about 15 minutes out of the cbd um they're very affordable and that's where that that market of sort of around that 150 dollars a night does really well it's not so much a tourist coming and staying in those properties as it's more mm -hmm. someone traveling for work or visiting family or they're normally here for a different purpose those ones are just in the outer ring areas um and that's where yeah those those properties that are at a more affordable price point do really well yeah i like that um i want to kind of let's talk, talk about, numbers can we talk let's numbers, talk Joe? numbers. Okay. let's talk numbers and this is the first part of the numbers is i've decided to put my property in cronulla up for airbnb um i don't want to use all my stuff the place is completely empty i just bought it um how much does it cost to set up an airbnb like what is the yep. what is the infrastructure internal setup i need i need those amazing ikea chairs the seats the the tables the all of that what does that look like so it very much depends on the size of the property we've done one bedroom apartments furnished them with secondhand furniture that still looks incredible and done it for as little as three and a half thousand and then we've had professional stages come in and do all the shopping for the clients furnish them all out all brand new furniture and it sits somewhere at between 20 to 30,000 depending on the size of the home. So it does depend on the size of the home whether you can do it yourself or not. Obviously, it is pretty time consuming to go out there and buy all the knickknacks, buy all the furniture, especially if you want to buy it secondhand and you turn up and some of the stuff's not as it's advertised on Facebook Marketplace or Gumtree. So it just depends whether you're furnishing it yourself or paying someone to furnish it. But the short of the long is somewhere between three and a half to thirty thousand, depending on where you get it all and who does it. Well, yeah, what so about what are, the, what are the more expensive? If if I'm going up to thirty k, what are the expensive big ticket items that are going to cost me that? So it's stuff like your couch. You can spend a thousand dollars on a couch. You can spend six thousand dollars on a couch. Yeah, a mattress. Sense. You can spend a thousand dollars on a mattress. You can spend four thousand dollars on a mattress. Yeah. A fridge, you can spend $600 on a fridge or you can spend $6,000 on a fridge. Yeah, okay. So it's just choosing which items to go a little bit more expensive on and which items you can cut corners and be a bit cheaper on. Is there a sweet spot if, if you're at a, say, a free or 600 oh, let's say $600 a night, I imagine yeah. you'd probably want to spend maybe... Absolutely, yeah. If you're, if you're sitting at that $600 a night, you do want a little bit more upmarket mattresses in particular a bit comfier couch, so on and so forth. Big thing when you're shopping is keeping in mind the wear and tear. We were joking before on white on white and painting things white. When it comes to your couches and that sort of thing, you probably want to be going greys and stuff that stains, less likely to stain. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's certain things that I would comfortably cut corners on, on even a higher end property, and that's like your fridge. You can very much get away with a, a cheap fridge. People aren't expecting the latest Samsung touchscreen fancy schmancy fridge we can get away with a cheaper fridge in the property um we use ensembles for all of our bed bases so rather than going like a fancy bed base and bed head and so on and so forth we just have the the flat ensemble it's a lot easier to make the beds on slight side note but it's also a really cost effective way by the time we put some artwork in the rooms look good and it's just a cheap bed base yeah that's that's really good and one thing that that we have on our mattress is a mattress topper um, and it ma makes the mattress a lot more uh, comfortable, even though it might not be the best mattress in the world, but it's got like a, I don't know, maybe that's a thing. Yep. Just, just um, take mattress, prote mattress, mattress protectors protector. is a big one. So yeah, people yeah. will spill drinks. People may even wet the bed. You know, you want to make sure that you've got your mattress protectors on. If you're spending yeah. $1,000, 2000 $3,000 on a mattress, to then spend the $50 to get a good mattress protector is a, a good investment. Okay. Um, one thing that's come a good question. Can you use depreciation on new furniture? So absolutely you can depreciate your new furniture. Absolutely you can depreciate the secondhand furniture provided you've got proof of purchase. So if you're buying stuff off Facebook mar marketplace, mm -hmm. make sure you're screenshotting the, the conversation with the person you bought it from. Make sure you're screenshotting the, the listing and you can use that as a receipt and depreciate the amount you paid for it. So if you paid $200 for a table, you can actually depreciate that $200 table because it still has a usable life on it. You've just, just got to be able to show proof of ownership, proof of purchase. So linen hire, um, 
What exactly is that? Yeah, what, what, what? You hire a living joke. <laughs> so, depending on whether you're managing the property yourself or got an Airbnb management company, so we hire all our linen. So, our linen is done commercially at a big laundry mat. We pull it out of the property, and quite often it's stained and filthy, and the towels have got makeup all over it. We give it to the linen hire place. They take it, they bleach it, they treat it, they do whatever they do to it. And then we get brand new looking white sheets back. So linen hire is definitely the, the way to go. Even if you're self-managing, approach some of the, the laundry mats. If you're in a reasonable size city, there's a chance that someone will do linen hire in the area and it just saves so much work. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't imagine doing that yourself. Um, okay, cool. So we're we're in for ten grand, average ten grand a, a pop to set our property up. One of the things that you were talking about while we're off air was you spend ten thousand dollars. That's your sunk cost. You now have yep. ten thousand dollars worth of furniture. So if for whatever reason Airbnb doesn't work for you, that's it. You got ten grand. That's it. You're fine. Yep. Um, I love that. Like it's that's just you're not. There's no other money that you've lost really. And or that is probably there? leads itself to my my quote of the day. You know, that irreversible risk. So if you're dropping 10 grand on furniture, you could probably turn around and sell it for five or 8,000. And then your risk is two to 5,000. So your Cronulla house, Joe, I'd be very much considering looking at putting that on Airbnb. The reality is it's a risk of maybe five grand. If it turns out it doesn't work for whatever reason, you've risked five grand. Like yeah. in the scheme of investing, that's a, a pretty good sort of, pretty good punt yeah yeah that's a that's a good shout okay so we're five grand in um what are what are some of the other costs so essentially so let's say we already own the property we already own the property um yep. we've looked on airbnb and gone the nightly rate looks attractive mm-hmm. the occupancy rate for us we base everything on a 70 percent occupancy rate it's pretty mm-hmm. realistic it's pretty hard to achieve higher than 70 percent for a bigger property. So if you've got like a small one bedroom unit, you can get a lot of last minute bookings and really fill small gaps and you'll get close to 90%. But on a bigger, say like a three or a four bedroom property, the reality is it's pretty hard to sort of get much north of 75 to 80%. But we work our sums off 70% occupancy. So jumping onto Airbnb, you can see what the nightly rate is for similar properties times that by 365 and then times that by 70% will give you your gross annual return. Yep. Um, so let's use your example that you've, that you've got there. Yep. Um, 2,400 one. Oh, yep. Yeah, yeah. The more like affordable one that makes that, that would probably be more realistic for, for other people. 159, is it? Or? Yeah. So let's... Yeah, show us the better boy. Yeah, the, the examples all the examples and the cash flow is actually staggering. Like it's what got us into the market is the cash flow. You go, holy shit, that's considerable because the reality is it is pretty juicy. So to to run some numbers, I've pulled up my calculator here. No one's gonna be able to see it, but I'll talk through some numbers. So essentially that one on the Esplanade will comfortably yeah. rent for, for four hundred dollars a a night. Mm-hmm. And, and do you average that out? Like, do you say in peak period, we're going to get 600 in the low period, we're going to get 300. So we, we have not yeah. that that's the average. That's not the answer. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Correct. So yeah. that one on the Esplanade there, it's 350 in the low season. Um, and then in the mid and the high season, you're going to be more up sort of around that five to 550 a night. Yeah. But let's even run that one on an example. So say it's $400 a night and 70% occupancy works out to be about five nights a week. So, um, a four is two grand a, a week. Let's say that one returns two grand a week, which is 400 a night. Your five nights a, a week gives you $2,000 a week um, income on that one. Do we want me to run through the full example of what that would actually look like for a year? Yeah, definitely. Please. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we've got two, two grand a week. So that's based on five nights. So two nights a week, that property is going to sit vacant, which gives us our 70%. If we times that by the full year, it's 104000 that property is going to generate. Yeah. Of that 104000 to rewind quickly, on top of the nightly rate, Airbnb charges a cleaning fee. That mm-hmm. cleaning fee basically covers the cost of cleaning that property. Property like that, three-bed, two-bath, that location, 
is going to be somewhere between two hundred and two hundred and fifty dollars a clean. So that's right. between sort of four four to five hours for make sure it's absolutely spotless. And that two two hundred to two hundred and fifty is getting charged back to the guest. So that's sort of a net sum zero. It doesn't really need to come into the calculations because the cleaning costs are what it costs. We can leave that out of this equation. Does that make so sense? They always are just pretty much dead on. Like when you say it is two hundred dollars, it actually is two hundred dollars most most of the time. Or do you find that that tenants, I mean landlords, are out of pocket? No, nah, pretty much is bang on the cleaning fees that we charge. So we get pretty yeah. good at knowing how long a property of what size is going to take, cool. and we charge charge on Airbnb the additional cleaning fee to to cover that. So for for us, it is it is bang on, and what the client and yeah. what the guest is actually paying is basically bang on what the, the changeover cost is. So that's so let's, yeah. so let's just say they've they've stayed for five nights, so they've paid they will pay sort of two thousand so four hundred a night plus the yep. two hundred bucks, which is two thousand two hundred. Yep. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So essentially and how much did that, you buy this place for? Oh well how much is this place worth now on the market, would you say? Yep. So this place, they bought this quite recently. It's all public knowledge we're here anyway. Um, they paid six twenty five. Yeah. So, thirteen yeah, percent yield, roughly gross yield, thirteen percent. Yeah, gross yield. But the gross, as everyone knows, the gross is sort of a worthless figure. The gross doesn't tell too much of a story. Yeah. We're really interested in what the net is. Obviously, the yeah, tell us the net. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Sixteen point so, six four as a gross. Uh, yeah. So, so the gross is tells one story, but the net's really what we're all here to play. Is what what we end up in our pocket. So of the booking, essentially the, the booking platform. So it's not only Airbnb, but it's VRBO, which owns Stays, Expedia, Hotels.com. They own about like 20 different sites. Um, that's VRBO. And then there's also Booking.com. Most people are probably pretty familiar with Stays, Expedia, Booking.com, Airbnb. They're all platforms that offer a service for people to book. They all operate one and the same. Um, Airbnb is obviously what this space is known for. People think short-term rentals, they think Airbnb, but there's a zillion other platforms that all have people booking on them every single day. All of those booking platforms pretty much charge the same commission. So they essentially charge 15% of the booking fee. So if they get a $2,000 booking, they're essentially charging $300 for that booking and they pocket the 300 they're okay. multi-billion dollar companies for a reason. They're making absolute squillions. Let's go and start one of these ones, Joe. That sounds fun. Yeah. I'll, I'll be charged for 50. <laughs> it would only cost a little bit to sort of advertise and compete with them. Um, but essentially, they are charging 15%. So of that $2,000 booking, you're going to lose $300 of that to the booking platforms. It's essentially you need to need to pay to play. So that brings you 104000 down to... 104,000 down to yeah, 88,000 essentially. Yeah. From that 88,000, then you've got management fees. And that's where, so we deduct our fee off the outgoing costs. So the, the, the cost that the booking platform pays. So if the booking platform pays 1,500, we deduct our commission from the 1,500. We don't deduct it from the top figure. Does that make sense? Which okay. you, you deducted from after the platform takes their fee. Correct. We deduct it from after the platform takes their fee. So you fee. take it from the 88,000? From the 88,000, correct. Is uh, where, where we take that. So essentially that 88,000 is what, what gets paid into to our, our trust account, our real estate trust account. And then we deduct our fees from that. So that's your net, your net payout is essentially what, what we class that figure as. Yep. From the 88,000, 88,000, your typical management what? fee. Yeah, you're right, you go. Sorry, where are you going? No, that's where you're going. That was going to be my next question. What's the management yep. fee? Your typical management fee sits between sort of 20 to 25% is where your, your average management fee comes in for short term. For, for us, our management fee includes all the linen that we provide. So all the linens included in our management fee, all the consumables, all your little your Oreos, your chips, your waters, all of that's included in the management fee. 
And that's pretty much industry standard to include that stuff in the management fee. So we're trying to make it as passive as possible for the investors. So the investors that are buying these properties, they can live anywhere in the world and we're taking care of absolutely everything, into, including all those little, little costs that do add up, your linen hire, your consumables, your soaps, your shampoos, your milk, your tea, your coffee, all of the above. Yeah. So going okay. well here. I should create this as a, as a, as a handout or something. Yeah. But I, yeah, know, I think like... so. I think this would be, I mean, it's pretty basic, but um, okay, cool. Um, what, what other fees are we dealing with? Yeah. So essentially that's going to bring you somewhere around sort of that 60 odd thousand. Um, yeah. It should be somewhere around that 60. Oh, you've got 66. 66 we'll, run yeah. With, yeah. we'll run with that. From there, um, the only additional cost from that point compared to a long-term management is your power, which you're going to be looking at about $150 a month. Um, so call that, what are we, 1800 a year? Yep. And then internet, which is about $60 a month. So, Oh, wow, that's pretty cheap internet. Yeah, 720 depending on the plan. Like, yeah, it might be $75. Really, it's sort of inconsequential in the grand scheme of things, what the internet might cost. What, what about like council rates and stuff? So then you've got, so, but that's sort of, you your council rates are going to be comparable whether it's residential or um, short term. But for this property, mm -hmm. your council rates would be 2700 a year if we want to work through the full example. So you go 2700 for council rates. And this complex does have a lift. It does have pools. It does have on-site management. So the body right. corporates are a little bit more expensive here. And you're going to be looking at about 9500 for body corporate fees. Per year. Per year. Yeah. How about, um, is insurance a bit extra, is it? Or is that rough? I can't quite Yep. So it. insurance is the only thing we've left out there. Your, if you went a Terry Shear short term policy, you'd be looking at about 390 per year. Uh, 3,900, sorry. 3,900, not 39. Yeah. 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 Insurance is <laughs> yeah. That would be great. No, no. Your insurance, you've got an extra zero on there. Oh, 300. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what? So, for the year. so your body, your body corporate includes your building insurance or your building oh. maintenance. Um, so you're only actually covering your public liability and your malicious damage under your, your um, short term stay insurance. Yeah. Um, okay. So we are in and, and, and anything else? That's it. We cover the cost of everything else. So your linen, everything's covered by, by us on our end. By, All your little consumables, everything else. Wow. Um, by the yeah. This uh, would would, would so, you say that this particular example is is one that um, I mean this this sounds like a pretty fancy sort of place. So would you say that this sort of re uh, return or is 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 um, achievable in in most properties or what sort of? I would say that's pretty standard. I wouldn't say that's an excellent Airbnb return. Okay. Um, but it's not terrible. So that 8.15 is is pretty, I'd consider that the average. Like we've got properties that were bought for around 400,000 that are doing close to that as well. Like they're, they're probably sitting more of like a, a 10 or 11% yield. Just because they were sort of, this one's appreciated it, or the cans market. Well, yeah, this one's worth 625. So, you know, if we spend 50% less, it doesn't actually reduce the nightly rate by 50%. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then what um, would this house rent for on the long-term market by itself? This this property on the long-term market would rent for about 650 to 700. Should we put up the disclaimer, Joe? Not financial advice. The Not financial advice. advice. It's just math. Do your own sums. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, do your own. Zero dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but that yeah. five point four is your gross. Gross. Yeah, yeah we have very, gone yeah. and deducted everything, including residential management fees and the rest of that. Yeah, yeah. So we do six fifty times by fifty two, um, and then we minus our your body uh, corporate. All of this, what is it? Wi-Fi, body, all of that. Well, you wouldn't be paying for Wi-Fi, but I mean, it's... Oh, you... Oh, well, oh, yeah, true. It's a rental. You don't pay for... Your tenant pays for internet. If in a... In a rental, long-term. 
<clears throat> oh, it's all I've messed it up here. But you yeah, messed it up. It's but we get the point. We, uh, probably, it's a lot less. You'd probably find that the net on that would be somewhere around three percent. Yeah. By the time you include management and the rest, it's probably setting at around a three percent net yield. Well, yeah. I mean, we haven't even talked about finance, though. Like, oh, well, yeah. um, if you, I mean, yeah. If if you, I mean, we've got a deal crunch calculator that people can. Um, let's just go to Oz. Oh, anyway, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to, yeah. Um, you can, yeah, we've got the deal crunch calculator, which we could have gone through and, and show you what it would look like from a net perspective to actually actually buy that. Um, yeah, but that was cool. Okay, so we, we've we got 8.5, so we've taken from 5.4% gross, gross to an 8.15% net, net return. Um, and that's, the property does need to be in the right location. I think that's something worth stressing, like... Yeah. Not every property is going to be suitable. That one is in the right location. But there's also, you know, properties that are going to be a slightly, you know, that's probably what I cast as an A-grade a lo location. There's certainly properties in B-grade locations that do just as well, if not better. Um, your purchase price is a lot less, but the, the nightly rate comparably is still really strong. So there's nothing wrong with the B-grade areas. It just needs to be an area that feels safe and has a demand, which... You know, there's a lot of cities where there's a big transient workforce. You know, people might come in for contract work for whatever reason. Those areas also do really well in the short-term market. Yeah. Um, well, someone's written here, insurance and then channel manager. What's a channel manager? Yeah. So, great question. So, insurance, they might have missed the fact that that was in a strata complex. So, if you're in a strata complex, a strata will cover your building insurance. So I think that's Australian-wide, no matter where you are, if you're paying Strata, it covers your building insurance. So the only insurance we did include in that um, little sum that we just quickly worked out was the um, landlord insurance that covered you for short-term stays. So your landlord insurance, a bit like if you've got a residential unit, your landlord insurance is pretty a pretty small amount in the grand scheme of things. So we did include insurance on that example. The channel manager, so if you're listed on multiple platforms, so if you're listed on Airbnb, booking.com, other platforms, you run the risk of someone booking a week hit on one platform and then the other platform also someone else booking the same weekend and then you've got two guests trying to stay in one property, which doesn't work. So essentially it's a bit of software called a channel manager that basically makes sure that if someone books something on Airbnb, it gets blocked down on the other websites. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a bloody great point. <laughs> because, yeah, if you've got it up on four or five different sites and it books on one, then it's, yeah, yeah. it'd be a bit awkward if it got double booked. And that's something, if you're self-managing, obviously that cost of the, the channel manager, not that it's, it's, I think it's like $14 a month per property or something like that. Um, yeah. It's something that you'd need to factor in here if you're self-managing. Obviously, if you're hiring... Someone, if you're hiring a management company to look after it, they're including that in their, their costings. I think, should, should we, um, should we, have, have we, have we talked for numbers? Anybody got any questions on the numbers? Um, because there's, there's something else, there's a bit of a, I wouldn't say it's a hand grenade, but it's one of those can of worm topics that, that we, we spoke a little bit about before. But I suppose any I think, questions you got on them? I can see a couple of comments coming up here about finance and like people are saying where we're missing the cost of the loan. I well, think the cost that of loans example, there regardless of whether you're yeah. buying. Yeah, sorry. Go. Exactly right. The loans there regardless. So if that property is, you know, if you've had that property for a little while and it's a residential property, you're really just considering what the returns are as a short-term rental versus a long-term. The loans exactly the same costing regardless of of which way you go. Um, so, same so probably, probably this, technically on Joe's, it's not not really net. It's net of oh, it's gross ex-finance costs so i think it's what they yeah. might be saying but anyway yeah uh well joe, i mean so joe here is what out. yeah so here is what happens if you purchase this property for six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars with a 20 percent deposit um everyone has access to this if you go to ozproperty.com.au and it'll pop up and you can download this free deal crunch calculator but um if we have a look up here it's a 5.41 percent yield like we said before is a gross um, cash on cash return. You would need to 
oh, it doesn't matter how much you need to push down. But essentially, after all expenses here, your council rate, body corporate, a landlord insurance management fees, you're down four th a negative 4279 Um are there other fees that we're missing here outside of finance? So finance is um, $26,000. So if we take $26,000 as finance, so it's all equal and fair, it means that you've got a, you have all of your expenses, you're going to have positive cash flow, 25 grand, or are there more expenses that other people are mentioning on there? No, we've covered off. The only other thing people have mentioned is maintenance cost. Um, oh, yeah. Once again, with the cleaning teams coming in and cleaning the property at least once or twice a week, I really see the maintenance is very similar between a, a residential property and a, a short term rental property. So it's not, it's a very much an apples, apples to apples. It's not an additional cost per se. Um, but, you know, if you're wanting to include it in, you'd include it in on both sides of the equation. So we're now looking at a, $22,000 and then let's have a $2,000 contingency right for miscellaneous um, and at the end of the day you're negative 5,000 and you're positive 20,000 yeah what do you want <laughs> which one do you want you tell and, me <laughs> and that's where like it, it is case by case so it's like every single property What's going on with that sound, Joe? That was the lightning. That was massive. Oh, geez. Well, that was good. We are. We are we, I do. I, I, yeah, yeah. He's he's watching it on his face. So the, the the thing that's uh thing that I will sort of um not not to I don't want to turn this into the, into a debate, but if if we say because the type of property that's suitable for an Airbnb may not necessarily see the same type of capital growth. I mean, it may, it may not. I mean, I, I mean. Courses for courses, but um, I think that's probably where you need to sort of figure out what type of investor you are. And what Seek independent are. legal financial advice. Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. But yeah, because because I mean, if 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 somebody wants more cash flow, then oh, I guess got enough. Then then this this may be for them. But uh, if they're looking for capital growth, it may not be the investment. And I think this, you know, that very much plays into the debate. I guess we're not going to have, but that capital capital growth versus cash flow debate. That's as yeah. old as old as eons, um, but you know if you are considering something to boost your cash flow, I think Airbnb is well worth the consideration. Should we should we have should we have one? Of the, I want to ask the audience: Do do lenders assess income? This, this is a great question. I mean, this is probably a mortgage broking question, but do you have any insights to to this one, Sean? Do lenders actually mm -hmm. assess the income of a? Uh, if yeah. I'm trying to build a portfolio and scale and grow, um, yeah. How's it assessed? Three three part answer to this one. If you're buying a property as a brand new property, um, you're wanting to Airbnb it. You've just run the numbers. You've gone. This is going to be heavily cash flow positive. You're taking it to the bank. You don't have a track record on that property. All you can do is provide the bank with a long term residential rental appraisal. So you, you get a rental appraisal from the agent from a real estate agent and provide that to the bank, they won't take the Airbnb income into consideration for a brand new property. If you've had an Airbnb property up and running for, for two years, there is a number of lenders that will consider that and look at that income, but they will shave it. I don't know the exact ratios, but I think they do shave it by 30 or 40% and only take into consideration 60% of the income. Yeah. And then the third option, which is a little bit more conv complicated and a little bit more convoluted and it's something that we're doing is you can lease your own properties to a company that you own and then have that company run records for several years and you know then it's treated as no different no different than any other business interesting ah okay yeah yeah, yeah. I see. so yeah you you lease you essentially lease leasing your own property to the company the company are leasing the property and then they are making the profit on the difference between the, the, the lease and what they make. Fun. Um, someone, I imagine a broker, um, I hope a broker, um, if you're no, not no, a broker. No, no, somebody I'll... talking talking to their broker. Oh, uh, yeah. So if you're not, yeah. Uh, ANZ takes rental after 12 months, capped at 7% yield, NAB two years, shaded, Macquarie shade, 35%, I think. Oh, from talking to my yeah. broker. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah that sounds about right. That's Yeah, that's pretty consistent of what I've heard. And what I've gone through. Wow, unreal! 
yeah. the, the, the can worms that I want to open is, and it oh. might not be that big of, I don't think it's a debate or anything like that, but it, it, it came up a bit in some of the comments on Joe's various posts is about taking stock off the rental market. So yep. increasing the, the rental crisis that's out there. We should have done a big kind of controversial post about this, but yeah. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Anyway, Sean, I've got some thoughts. I'm sure Joe does too, but what do you, what yeah. do you think? So a couple of thoughts on that. Firstly, I think is it's very easy to either put, yeah, it's, as investors, I think we can wear a number of hats. I think if you're wearing the hat of how do I make money in this market and without being ruthless, I think there is an opportunity for Airbnb to make money in this market. So I think that's first and foremost. If you're looking at purely as an investor and not getting too political, then there's a, definitely an opportunity. There's also an opportunity where the Airbnb market does bring a lot of money into local economies. If you look at the nightly rate they pay plus the money spent, they certainly bring a lot of money to local economies. It creates a lot of jobs. Like Byron Bay, for example, is a, a great case study. There's a ridiculous number of Airbnbs in Byron Bay. If yeah. Byron Bay was to outlaw those Airbnbs entire, entirety, you would lose so many of the jobs in that area. They'd be gone. So it's one of those things, the population and the jobs are there because of the Airbnbs, but, you, but there's a housing shortage because of the Airbnbs. You take the Airbnbs away and suddenly there's no jobs in that area. So it's sort of the, the pick between mm. the, the lesser evil. I've not quite understood Byron Bay because the, the roads to get in, they're absolute rubbish. So you got one road, they have not, like, why <laughs> Why do people go? I don't get, yeah, anyway, that's my, nice. I'll get off my soapbox about, I'd much rather, that there's, there's some really nice places in the hinterlands outside of Byron. But, um, but yeah, in, interestingly as well, um, because to put it into context, I think we spoke about this last week, I think you said in Cairns there's probably, what, a 1,000 Airbnbs Correct. out of, what, 35,000? Yeah. I mean, how many properties are there? Yeah, so in? there's a 1,000 there's a Airbnbs, but probably of that 1,000, probably around 350 are actually zoned for short term. Okay. So they're, they're zoned as hotels. Technically, you can't live in those properties for longer than three months. Yep. So they've got it, their own zoning code. So there's probably around 700 additional the 700 residential properties being used for airbnb in cans and there's probably somewhere between 35 to forty thousand homes so yeah. that's so um, we're talking about a drop in the ocean compared to compared to like an, another example is is what they've done in brisbane where they we had alex alex stefan on a town planner who said that um the state government opened up granny flats for everyone so everyone that had a granny flat, you can now rent um, individually. Uh, that's going to put a massive, a massive supply. Still not enough, but I think very topical at the moment. Like if we're looking at if we're putting our political hat on and we're wanting to help the rental crisis, I think there's a lot more more there's a lot more effective options that will have a greater impact, like opening up granny flats like incentivizing investors to build new homes that will have a much greater impact than just shutting down Airbnb, which will have all those unintended consequences. Yeah. Taking, taking money out of the local economy, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The, the yeah. reality is at the end of the day, there isn't enough dwellings in Australia. They need to build more dwellings. The cost of buildings going up. They need to incentivize investors to, to get out there and build brand new. It's really the only solution. Yeah, but then we can't afford to because the building costs are so so pricey and crazy. But you look at the amount of government taxes involved in doing a new development, like the subdivision costs, all of that stuff that essentially is just purely a tax. Well, 15, very much... 15K in Logan to build a granny flat, like charge you yes. 15, because it's probably too many it's granny flats in Logan. Crazy. But the, the, that sort of stuff, if they're very, if they're actually serious about helping the rental crisis, why do they need to slug the developer fifteen grand in taxes? Surely they can incentivize those developments. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a great point. Yeah. Um. So I guess this is the great thing about this. I mean, we've we've shown a very rosy picture of uh, um, Airbnbs. What are some of the not so rosy things about owning an Airbnb? What are some of the downsides and ugly ugly sides of Airbnb life? Yeah, probably the, the considerations I think people need to take into 
into account is what we've just touched on in regards to legislation. It is a hotly debated topic at the moment and probably is cheap political points for the politicians to come out and mess with it. So I think that needs to be considered that, you know, what is plan B if that was to happen and what does that look like? There is examples like Brisbane's in talking about increasing the rates for people that have their properties on the short-term rental market. Something like that wouldn't be the end of the world if they were charging an extra $500 in rates. whoop do you do it? Life goes on. Um, but that's definitely one of the downsides. The second downside is someone doing malicious damage to your property, which that's a risk whether you're in the long-term rental market or the short-term rental market. Um, I've been involved in the long-term rental market for almost a decade now, or coming up to over a decade. And be it in the long-term, be it in the short-term market, there is, there is people that will do the wrong thing. And I think you just need to factor that in, make sure you've got the right insurance in place and the right management team, you know, whether it's long-term rentals, short-term rentals, because, yeah, things can go wrong. This is this question came at the start. What are the risks of short-term rentals? I tried private long-term rentals and met with the shonkiest people of, of my life. So I guess it's 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 human nature, right? You, you are having someone living in your house. You'd be having multiple people living in your house. One um, of the... One of the good things on the short-term rental space is that we're receiving payment up front. Um, so before anyone arrives and stays in the property, they've already paid. So that's one factor that you're not happening to deal with that quite often comes up in the long-term rental space. But very much people can be shit regardless of, <laughs> regardless of yeah. what space you're in. People can be shit. So it's just it is a factor of playing the game. Is there a bond? And, like, what if someone steals, like, you know, steal something of value like the table or or a chair um, or breaks a chair and those type of things. You, it's not like you're going to chase. Can you chase so, someone so up? Or take, take down a credit card. So, yeah, we take the, yeah, the credit card details, the driver's license. Um, yeah, but you can't just take someone's credit card details and then charge whatever you want. Like They do. So they agree, to, they agree to our agreement. So before they come into the property, we've got like a 20-page agreement that they sign off on. No one ever reads, but essentially in that agreement is if malicious damage happens, if they steal, so on and so forth. So there is that layer of protection, but there's also, we recommend having your own landlord policy, which does cover you for malicious damage, malicious theft. Plus Airbnb has its own insurance, but the Airbnb insurance is rubbish. Um, it's Ooh. there, it's an option. <laughs> it's worth having a crack if something goes wrong to get the Airbnb cover because there's no excess. Um, but it's rubbish, the Airbnb cover. You're better off having a, your own private policy. What, what, are, what are some of the holes with the, uh, I, mean, I mean, maybe people should read the PDS, but private disclosure statement. But yeah. For Airbnb cover? Yeah. They're, they're real brutal on like their um, depreciation. So if you've got an item there and the, the item's a year old, they might pay you 20% of what it's worth. Oh, okay. So it's not like new for old cover and that sort of thing. Absolutely read the PDS and the, the rest of it, but I would recommend having um, your own landlord policy through like EBM, Terry Shear, or, you know, a more reputable insurance provider that's, yeah. 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 And you find if, if someone's trying to do everything, it's, it generally doesn't work out very well. If you're looking for insurance, go to someone that does insurance. Um, yep. Correct. But, Correct. So like, we should, you know, I, I always... I always fear what I don't know. It's what you don't know. It's, you know, it's not, not knowing what you don't know is a, is a challenge where at least if you've got a vague idea of what something is, at least you're already on the right path where if you just completely have no idea, it's always a challenge. I'm actually concerned if I think I know something about something because it means that I probably know no, no less. I mean, I'm more dangerous because I think I know something, but I actually don't know anything. Um, yeah. Not that Jahari window kind of thing, but yeah, anyway. Getting on tangent. So we, we, should we go to questions? Or, Joe, is there any other questions you have before we? Because there's, heap, there's heaps of questions that I've started. No, I mean, I'm. I, this has been, it's been awesome. Um, it's good sure. to break down a real deal and actually see what it looks like from having it on a rental market. I think that's super valuable. Um, are there any other uh, uh, things to be aware of? Any other kind of not so rosy, rose-colored glasses for Airbnb? So I think that's sort of, I think we've covered off a lot of it is the legislation change, people being shit people, which does happen, but it's not not the majority by any measure. Um, I'd mm -hmm. say it's very similar, very similar ratios to the long-term rental market in regards to, to 
people being shit. Um, and then vacancy rates. So just looking at the area that you are looking at setting up an Airbnb and just working out how seasonal it is. There's probably a lot mm. of errors that can be made on the front end of it, doing the sums with those real rose colored glasses versus actually sort of working out your actual vacancy rates. Is it going to sit, you know, book 70% of the year or is it more likely going to be around that 40% or how much do I actually need to discount my prices to get them booked in the off season? Yeah. Do, do, do you have like a high, do you have like a low, uh, an expected or a medium and a high kind of like a, a sensitivity analysis? Absolutely. Yep. So we run those, those three, three different pricings. Um, and that sort of, we can run the pricings and those analysis on two different ways. We can do it on a, a cost per night and we can do it on occupancy. So you could work it out on 60, 70 and 80% occupancy and you could work it on three different nightly rates as well. Yeah. yeah and if you're thing. looking at, at, at a good capital growth area and you think, hey, I think I can Airbnb this, just run a comparative. How much is the minimum occupancy that I would get for this property before it breaks even with just having it as a long-term lease and and not worrying about it. Um, but at the end of the, like, the, I'm kind of thinking about this. So I used to run a, a fleet of vans on a platform called Car Next Door. Um, so that was my little side hustle. Um, and it's exactly like Airbnb. Someone books their thing and then you get an alert and then they go, they take your car, they drive around, they, they come back, you've got to clean it and do do all of that stuff. Um, but if it's all outsourced, like I had someone that would clean the thing and then I had a mechanic that when there was an issue, they would go out to it and I didn't do anything. I just got, I just got paid. Is it, is it like that? Is it as hands off um, as a long-term lease? Is there more involved for me as a, as a landlord than there is on a long-term tenancy? There's probably a lot of people watching this that have long-term property managers and there's probably a lot of people that have had multiple different long-term property managers. And some of those property managers would have been absolutely incredible and they very rarely heard from them and they just took care of everything. And then there would have been other property management managers that just called them over every little thing. The tenant's got this little issue that's actually got nothing to do with the property. I actually don't need to call you about that, but I'm calling you about it anyway. So it very much depends on the property manager as to hand, how hands-off it can be. But that's the same as the long-term market. You know, if you've got a good property manager in the long-term market, you're never going to hear from them unless there's something major, major. If you've got a good property manager in the short-term market, you're not going to hear from them unless there's something major, major. Mm. Okay. This is an interesting one. Um, it sort of come up a couple of times. I, are there... I, I, Hey, Kevin, you're not a not a, a property lawyer, but is there anything stopping someone from finding appropriately zoned rental and describing them and subletting on Airbnb? I think there probably is, isn't there? Like, you, aren't so you it's huge. In, it's huge in the states. Rental arbitrage in the states. There's a lot of people making a lot of money on it over there. In Australia, it's a lot less common. Um, you'd need to have a good relationship with the landlord. And you'd need to have a good sales pitch to sell them on the concept. Yeah. But it is possible. Because you, if, if you didn't, because there was a post in the group the other day and it went on, it was on the radio and it was on ABC and it was on news.com where the, somebody said, oh, look, I've been subletting my rooms or whatever. I, I think you, if you didn't tell the, the original landlord, you'd probably get in trouble with that, wouldn't you? Surely you'd be violating be some kind of... For, for me, it comes back to insurance. And both building insurance and public liability insurance. Um, someone trips in the bathtub and something stupid happens. You really want to make sure you're insured. So Otherwise, that, you know, they could they could take they could sue you for assets if they go correct, and cause correct. You fifty thousand dollars. Or if the guest in that property knocks over, decides to light a candle next to the bed as they have a romantic night, and then that candle sets fire to the building. It's those situations that you really want to make sure you're insured and covered for. We're not talking about a small asset when it comes to property. You know, you're talking four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand unit block could be worth ten million, could be worth a hundred million. So yeah, you want to make sure you've got the appropriate cover in place. Yeah, yep. And refer to some questions here. So how many how many owners come and stay in their property for a holiday? Maybe lots, lots property. and lots and lots. I'll do that. Um, okay. Yeah. Pretty much all of them, pretty much all of them <laughs> and for varying lengths. And it's part of the appeal. 
it's absolutely yeah. part of the appeal. And technically, it shouldn't be a tax write-off for the period that they're staying in their own homes. But I'm not their accountant, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah that's if you part pay, of the they do it. They, well, they would just block it out, wouldn't they? They'd say yeah. no vacancies getting cleaned. Yeah, yeah. Yes. correct. Yep. But it's definitely part of the appeal of, especially if it's in a destination that you like to go visit, having that holiday home there and being able to block the calendar off when you want, it's definitely part of the part of the appeal. Yeah. This one was yeah. interesting, I thought. This is probably more technical. I, I, I hadn't heard of an airkeeper or house um, or host. What, what are those? Is there any value in those, those ones? So essentially, my understanding of both of those is their housekeeping services. Um once again, it's probably no dissimilar to any other company. There's probably good housekeepers in amongst them. There's probably terrible housekeepers in amongst them. I think right. when you're looking at a company, it's only as good as the representative you're dealing with. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Um, yeah. The last or the, I'm sure there's probably heaps of questions. So we've probably got time for two more after this yeah, one. Throw some, if you any more questions that you guys... This is, take, this is and great. I think this is a I think this, this um oh well I mean it's kind of it's like when you've got a long term property manager it's it's a, obviously if you've got a bad so I think the question they're wanting to ask is if if it's vacant is it the property management Airbnb company that takes the risk or is it the uh, landlord it's, yeah. it has to be the landlord right it's very much the landlord but there's a lot that we can do with vacancy so if it's a small property and say like a one bedroom unit. There's quite often a lot of people just super transient last minute coming into town by themselves, where if you've got a property that sleeps six or 10 people, then it's pretty hard to fill those, those vacancies. So yeah, the long and the short is that the landlord takes the, takes the risk of the vacancies and that's where we work off those 70% numbers. We're not working on hundred percent occupancy for the full year. We're saying two days a week, the property is going to sit empty. Yeah. Yeah, this is. I, I, I think this will be our last question, unless somebody asks the, asks a crack of it. I thought this was amazing. I, I, I thought I'd ask this, and it'd be good to crystallise this. Can we give an example of a property we managed initially does not look to have a lot of bookings, and what what it's been done to improve it? I think we sort of taught, we touched on yep. a lot of it, but yeah, can we, if we crystallise that, it'd be great. So there's two factors as to why a property will will book, and that's price and marketing. Marketing, we spoke about the blurb not meaning a whole deal. The marketing really is the photos. The photos need to look attractive. People are online shopping. And when people are online shopping, whether it's clothes, jewelry, telephones, I don't know, whatever piece people buy online these days, they're looking for value. So we want the property to look super attractive online, but then it needs to be look like it's value, value for money. So that's where pricing comes into it. So if a property has got no bookings or very few bookings into the future, it's going to be one of those two things. Either the marketing shit, they've taken the photos themselves on their phone, they need to invest and actually spend the money on professional photography or make a world of difference. If they have done that, then it just comes back to pricing. They've priced it too high for what the market is demanding at the moment. Yeah, or it may not be suitable for a Airbnb because you're in the middle of nowhere and you haven't created that destination lifestyle type of property. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you I know, if you're that. looking, if you're looking on Airbnb and comparable properties are renting out around you, then it's going to come back to either marketing or price. Yep. This has been an unreal session. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, Airbnb is not something. It's it, for me. It's been put in the too hard basket. Like I've just put it here as I don't want to deal with bookings. I did the van business, and that was that was great, but it still wasn't. It was still annoying. Um, but if I can just hand, hand I want to see it you have a look at your Cronulla unit now. I want you to have a. I know. I'm, yeah. yeah. My we'll have to run the We'll we'll tee up yeah. the time and I'll run the numbers for you. We'll be able to have a look around and see what comparables are renting for. See what else is going. Yeah. Sure, a case study. Yeah. Case <laughs> study. We'll make it happen. So, Sean, what you've shared some absolute gems here. How can people learn more about you? Where can they get in touch? Um, yeah, so our company is The Hosting Co. Um, if you Google The Hosting Co. Cans, you'll, you'll find us. I, I just said no. that because I, I did I, I do some research and see what people's buyer. It looks like your, your wife also does a lot of, I think, I think she sort of manages a good amount of this sort of stuff as well, doesn't she? Yeah, Maybe. so essentially we've divided and conquered me and my wife. So she does a lot of our, our onboarding, a lot of the property styling. 
And then her face is way prettier than mine, so she's on all our listings. And then I do a lot of the operational stuff in the background. <laughs> like the gremlin in the in the, in the storeroom. <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but another good point. Uh, actually, no, I lost. I lost my good. I lost my good point. <laughs> Someone in the comments show us Cronulla. We all want to see Cronulla. You've brought it up now. Well, no. I'm, well, yeah. I don't want to share the address, um, but yeah, we can crunch it offline and maybe do a little case study about it. Um, you, should, you should have said it was another location, Joe. You should have said somewhere Janelli or somewhere just around the corner or something. No, I think I think it would be a great Airbnb. People would walk to the beach. That's what I. Yeah, so it's my PPOR. That's what I do every day. But it's like, can I actually? Great. Another question to ask. Um, I'm going away for you know. I might be away with work for a month because I'm traveling different states. Can I Airbnb for a month? Like, Absolutely. is that possible? So I think that's where like the whole Airbnb stuff originated from was people renting out their room for a week or renting out their whole house for a moment in time. Absolutely yeah. possible. You probably won't find a manager wants to take it on though. Um, mm. it's, it's our onboarding time. So there's probably a typical property we're spending somewhere in the range of sort of 30 to 40 hours setting it up between setting it up photography onboarding it onto all the different platforms putting it into our system um we sort of need a minimum commitment of around six months to make it worthwhile so yeah that's probably the biggest challenge where if you've got a friend and a good cleaner you could very much set it up airbnb the property and manage it yourself for that moment in time um but yeah it's probably unlikely you'll find a management company that will take it on for a short period of time so it's like the beans though, Joe. It could be could be a nice idea, but it just seems like a bit of a too hard basket, potentially. Mm, that's why I sold them. <laughs> awesome, awesome session. Thank you very much. Anything else that you wanted to cover off, Sean? Um, to, um, yeah, anything else you wanted to mention or, or talk about? I the think we covered a, a pretty good insight for anyone thinking about it. I would say don't put it in the too hard basket because you think it's going to be too hard. Reach out yeah. to the manager in your area. If you have a look on Airbnb and it looks like it might stack up and might work, don't put it in the too hard basket. Don't think it's going to be too much work. Don't think it's all too difficult. Reach out to an Airbnb manager in your area and you yeah. might be surprised just how streamlined it can be. I know we're kind of wrapping this up, but I just got another question is your, your properties all have the same flowers, the same tables, the same stuff. Can I see on the listing that you're the manager for that property? You can. Um, and then compare all of the different, you can then see who's the best manager. Yep. Correct. Wow. You can go to, so if you, you can either go to like our website direct and look at our stays and our properties that are available, or you can go onto Airbnb, stumble across one that we manage and then click on our profile. Um, and then from our profile underneath that's all our, all our listings that we do manage. And so the final starts. question that I think is, is very important to mention as well is, Sean, does your organisation manage properties in Victoria? Not at the moment. Give Ooh. us 10 years. 10 years? Ten years. It's, ten got a, years. it's got a 10-year plan. All right. 10-year plan. <laughs> ten year plan. So, you only, that's, so can you yeah, give us a bit of a geography of where you manage and look after? Literally can. So the cans... 20 cans to Palm Cove, essentially, which isn't a huge area. It's about probably a 20 kilometer catchment that we, we look after. Um, at the moment, the logistics of actually everything behind the scenes, which I don't want to say this to put people off, but there's a hell of a lot of logistics well, behind the scenes. You can, but that's you can what see you behind the on. scenes right now. You see all the all the stock and the yeah, the paper towel as well, the toilet paper. Yeah. So yeah, there's a, a lot of lot of logistics that go on behind the scenes. But that's what you pay paying your higher higher management fees compared to long term, um, and a, the good a good manager will take care of absolutely everything for you. So it is passive. So if you are an investor, you do own a property, reach out to a manager in your area. Um, if they're any good, they should take care of absolutely everything for you. Mm. Love it. Yeah, that's, awesome. That's a great way to wrap it up. Yeah. Thanks for um. Thanks for sort of um, being so trend. Like you, I, I see you on on a lot of posts, and you you go and. Uh, pizza and property toddy's toddy's potty um i yeah i i really respect people who openly transparently share stuff so good on you for, for doing that sort of stuff sean and and nah. you know, it seems like you guys are doing good things and i'm sure you will continue to do so absolute pleasure yeah. i appreciate right. you coming on mate thank you very much
Let's go buy an Airbnb property. See you guys.